All right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started and and you know do the announcements. Uh, welcome everybody. We have a a pretty interesting panel. As uh, in my opinion, I I've been on this bandwagon for a couple of years now. Um, but we're here to talk about the integration between computer science and pre-calculus. Um, we talked a little bit about how uh, computer science and, and math have a, a, a strong nexus. As a matter of fact, computer science could be viewed by some as uh, an applied mathematics at a high level. Um, but this particular conversation, this panel is going to talk about um, a specific mathematics uh, course or set of standards and how they can be actualized with computer science. Um, we have an esteemed panel. Uh, first up, we have Mark Guzdial, who many of you already know, uh, but now he's a professor in computer science and engineering and engineering education research at the University of Michigan. Um, after spending 25 years in the College of Computing here at Georgia Tech, which is where I uh, met Mark, he studies how people come to understand computing and how to make that more effective. He is an ACM fellow and received the 2019 ACM 60 Outstanding Contributions to Education Award. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Um, we also have Brandon Murray. Uh, after a short stint in the entertainment industry, Brandon taught math and computer science in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, when not teaching, Brandon uses his free time to expand his computing knowledge through free and open source software projects. He has a master's degree in STEM education. Brandon hopes to bring his passion for innovative, innovative computer science and math teaching to his new home in Georgia. Uh, Brandon now teaches computer science and I believe also math in Fayette County. Thank you for coming, Brandon. We welcome you to Georgia. Um, let's see, Craig Sapp is not with us right now. Um, I'll run his bio anyway. Craig has a bachelor's degree in mathematics, a master's degree in curriculum and instruction with an emphasis in mathematics and a specialist degree in curriculum and instruction. He has been teaching public school mathematics for 14 years with 10 years of experience teaching AP courses which includes AP Statistics and AP Computer Science. He's been a presenter for a college board workshops for AP Stat and AP CS in Georgia for four years and has created various computer science materials and resources for Georgia DOE. Um, appreciate Craig's help. Uh, and finally, Dr. Tamara Pearson. Hey, Tamara. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tamara Pearson is, an associate, is the Associate Director of School and Community Engagement at the Center for Education, Integrating Science, Mathematics, and Computing, also known as Seismic at Georgia Institute of Technology. Dr. Pearson received a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from Spelman College with a minor in Computer Science and a PhD in Curriculum and Instruction with a specialization in Educational Technology from the University of Florida. Her dissertation explored perceived understanding of gender, race, and class in discussions about technology with pre-adolescent, low-income African-American girls. Her current work focuses on partnering with schools and districts to help develop innovative curriculum and programs, as well as understanding how to best engage populations historically marginalized in STEM fields. Welcome, Tamara. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is a, a dynamic panel, everybody. Um, I'm going to jump off and let them take it from here. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll, we'll get back to them later on. Thank you, Brian. All right. No so Brian already took care of the first uh, piece of business to introduce your uh, your panel. I'm going to just speak briefly to lay out the argument and to show you a couple of things that I've been working on. So the first piece of the argument is that pre-calculus is important, maybe more important than we give it credit for. I mean, it's pre-calculus. I mean, it's pre. You know, it's it's not doesn't sound like it's so important. Not like algebra. I mean, it's the very found, uh, ground the groundwork of mathematics education. Um, but we think it's really important because it's critical to success in undergraduate calculus. And undergraduate calculus is the gateway to a STEM degree. You don't get a STEM degree unless you can pass calculus in most places. So the question is, how can we help kids to be more successful in, cre in pre-calculus or help more kids to be more successful? Here's one answer that we're all interested in. Maybe we can do it by making it more concrete. Maybe we put programming in pre-calculus because that programming with pre-calculus it influences the whole world. A whole lot of the things that we use on a daily basis with computing is really pre-calculus infused with programming, infused with technology. 
So we all got together because of a Department of Education effort led by Brooke Klein and our own Brian Cox, woo, to create a pre-calculus plus CS course to count as a fourth mathematics. Now, we haven't been able to make that happen yet, in part because there's a lot of concern. Is it too hard to use computer programming for this? Does programming make the math too hard to see, too hard to learn? This is some of the pushback that we're getting. And I think that it's a good point, and it's something that we're trying to understand. So maybe that is the case, but maybe we can make it better by making the programming more about pre-calculus. And that's a lot of what we've been trying to explore, those of us on this panel. So I'm just gonna go back to this one more time. Um, you'll see it again at the very end. Please do take a minute to fill out this form. I'll come back to this and do ask us questions in the chat as we go along. So here's one of the tools that I've been working on um, to explore this idea. So here's a picture broken down into the red, blue, and green channels. I can change the pictures and see it differently. I can manipulate this, this picture using pre-calculus matrix transformations. I can do scalar arithmetic, so maybe take all the green parts of the, of the uh, pixels and multiply them by something, or define matrix arithmetic, addition and subtraction, where I'm going to manipulate the red, blue, or green channels in different ways. I can add up, take a bunch of these manipulations, so make the blue equal to the green minus or plus the existing uh, red, okay? And now I have defined an image filter, which can be applied to this sheep or can be applied to any other picture. The idea is to say that matrix transformations, the kind that we see in pre-calculus, scalar arithmetic, addition and subtraction of matrices, that's actually the guts of things like Instagram, Snapchat, any sort of a photo filter is really just these matrix transformations, exactly the kind that you see in pre-calculus. Here's one more. Up here in the upper left-hand corner, you see a wave equation. Wave equations are also part of pre-calculus. I can make this wave equation so that I've got uh, amplitude of seven, uh, I've got a, a frequency of four. I can manipulate the red, the blue, I can manipulate things in either the X or the Y. I'm defining a set of wave operations. And when I compose these wave operations, which we're gonna see in a minute, so here I've got uh, amplitude of 10, frequency of seven in the blue along the Y axis. So up in the upper left-hand corner, that's a little program. It's a program composed of wave e equations. And when I put them together, I get an interesting pattern, which I can then go back and take a look at and see how it's been influenced by each of the individual waves. So the idea is that I compose waves together to create image filter, I'm sorry, to create image textures. I can also compose together um, the different, uh, I could also compose together to create audio patterns as well. So this is what I've been trying to explore in my work recently that I'm interested in trying to make computer computer programming. I'm suggesting that both of those are programming environments, but they're programming environments that are grounded in pre-calculus. So I'm a computing education researcher who's pushing after this idea that pre-calculus is really important and we can make it easier to learn by grounding it in application-based programming. Now, the rest of your panel, we've got two innovative math and computer science teachers who are doing this now, who are integrating programming and pre-calculus is what they're doing. Brandon's gonna go next. I'm hoping that Craig is gonna make it before we get to his session. If not, we'll pause for a little bit and let you play with some of these tools. And then Tamara, who's been, really been working on how to make math reform work in Clayton County, is gonna to talk to us a bit about what it takes to really make this happen. Okay, so let me return to this URL and I'm gonna drop out of this and see what do our, what do our responses look like? Okay, so uh, I'm hoping you all can see that. Let me zoom this in a bit. There we go. So about 34, 35% of our audience right now are pre-calculus teachers. About 13% are calculus teachers and 30% are doing other mathematics. We are totally keen on doing other programming and other mathematics as well. Um, we've got 60% are teaching other computer science. I don't know why my other, oh, I see this one is CSA or CSP, about 60% of the audience. And then we've got a lot of other folks teaching STEM, intro computing, digital media, and geometry. So one of the questions that, that we were all were interested in, Brandon in particular, since he's gonna show us some cool new tools, I was going to use computer programming and pre-calculus. I would most likely use 0% say CoCalc or Sage. Well, Brandon is going to convince you otherwise of that. Um, 
Uh, 13% say Unity. 70% of you are keen on using Python for this. 4% Scratch, 16% Snap, 4.2% uh, are Java or JavaScript, MATLAB, and others really hadn't thought about it yet. So let me pause there for just a minute. Do we have any questions in the chat that we need to get to, Brian? Uh, not at the moment. There's a nice, interesting, interesting discussion, but I think Tamara is handling it right now. I'm totally loving it. Okay, then let me turn it over to Brandon and I will stop sharing my screen and leave it to him. Thanks. All, all. right, let's see. Uh, is my audio working better? Do we got the echo now? It works great. All right, okay, so let me just pull this out. Okay, so I'm on a single screen here, so I might have trouble tracking uh, the chat window, but I'm gonna share, select that one. Okay. All right. So let's see. Did I lose? Let's see. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. So here, uh, sort of what I've done in the past is, let's see, I wanted to get to the main page. Um, what I've done in the past in teaching my algebra and, and math sections is try to infuse a little bit of programming in it, um, specifically using computer algebra systems. Okay, so Mark had asked a question about, you know, what kind of language would you want to use? The good news is um, this platform that I'm using, uh, it's actually a, it's actually a Python platform. Okay, so let me just kind of introduce here, CoCalc. Um, CoCalc is the name of the, the company. It's the name of this cloud computing platform but it's all based on top of something called Sage Math. Okay, so let's see. No. Um, and Sage Math was created as a free and open source computer algebra system. Let's see if I can get to it. Where is it? No, where are you at? You don't want to talk about Sage, do you? Um, okay. Um, I'll, just, I'll just punch it out here. All right, so... Sage Math is uh, basically what this gentleman did is he took a lot of open source mathematical libraries, he kind of stitched them all together and then edited the Python programming language to make computer algebra sort of like first class objects, okay? And so I'm gonna give some sort of demonstrations on that. Um, you can go ahead and download Sage Math on your, on your own computer, it's available for all you know, all the operating systems. Um, ooh, look, we're on Python three now. Okay. Um, so what CoCalc is? CoCalc grew out of this Sage Math project, uh, where let's see. Um, I'm trying to find. Okay, I'm gonna come back here. Nope. Um, it grew out of this Sage Math project to provide a online cloud computing platform to actually perform some of these computations. Um, and so what's nice about CoCalc is not only does it have the Sage Math uh, language in it, it also has quite a bit of other different programming features. And in fact, I mean, it really has, it's, it's got quite a lot. So, I mean, we can look here, it's got, uh, it's got Python, it's got R. Um, and if you, if you want to get real deep into it, it's got like, I don't know, uh, over a hundred different open source libraries. Um, and so it's actually really flexible because it's based on Linux and because you can, you know, go and run your own Linux terminal, you can install any programming language you can think of. But the, the focus for me has always been um, Sage Math. So I'm just gonna do a Sage worksheet real quick so I can demonstrate how Sage works, how CoCalc works, and then just mention how CoCalc has uh, class capabilities, abilities to put this, uh, you know, do this in classes, do handouts, do grading, automatic grading, and that sort of thing. Um, so my my view has been, well, in the early parts of pre-calculus, when we are talking more about uh, functions, you know, we go back over the functions we've been talking about for years and years. Um, one thing that I think would be neat is teaching students kind of how to program some of these functions in and how, how to how to implement the math in programming. Okay, so 
let me just do kind of a demonstration on Sage. This is Python, okay? So we have variables, um, and we can do our just basic basic stuff here. Okay, let's see if that works. Okay, so <clears throat> what you have is you have these little cells where you put in what's Python code, okay? Um, but, uh, and it just will kind of execute these little blocks for you. And you can do different text. People make textbooks. I can show that if I have the time, but I don't know that it's fully necessary. But you can intersperse uh, discussions, descriptions, learning materials, and then have code sections. Uh, what makes what makes Sage really nice is the built-in capabilities with all your computer algebra, okay? So here is my EX function. I can do things like this, okay? Plus three. Okay, and if I want, I can then add these two expressions up and it will do the math for me, okay? So that's the computer algebra side. Um, so just like in just like in Python, you can do print statements. It also has nicer display options. Okay, so if you want to show your stuff there, and then some of the things that you might expect to see in uh, in an algebra class. Let's do something like this. Okay, it has functions for al for algebra, so specifically like a, a factor a factor function. Let's see if I can get this to work right. Well, we'll do the show. Okay. So teaching, uh, taking those those basics that you've been doing in algebra, in algebra two for years, and seeing how you can get a computer. Okay. Um, same for an equation. We wanted to. We wanted to get this guy. Let's see. We wanted to solve that. Let's see. I might have to put a show statement. There you go. Okay. So it will even solve equations for you. Um, and it will do some basic plotting for you if you wanted to. Uh, so let's go from negative. Where are we at? Okay. So it's it's kind of a nice system in terms of the mathematics because it's based on Python. Um, I think it's kind of powerful for the programming side and trying to figure out some way to kind of pull them together uh, to to demonstrate your pre-calculus topics to dig further. Uh, in depth on some of those uh, on some of those topics. Okay, um, so again, some other basic stuff you can do. Let's see if I can get to it. teaching a course. Here we go. Um, CoCalc is nice for actually teaching the course. So not only does it give you the software here in browser, you can share stuff with students. Students um, can work on worksheets at the same time, so it has that sort of real time collaboration going on with it. But it also does let you do basic course management. Um, you can create a file, you can distribute it, you can grade it. It has automated grading. Um, it doesn't have any sort of connection to your learning management system, but you know, in terms of you know the group here, I, I'm looking for different sorts of IT solutions for how we can teach, you know, do this combined, this combined sort of course. And what sort of uh, yeah IT infrastructure might be useful and helpful for for teachers, especially math teachers who aren't going to want to have to do a whole lot of setup, um, but also an infrastructure that's 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 ready for the classroom and ready for math teachers. Um, so you can go and check it out. You can go to cocalc.com um, and create a create a free account. You do have to pay to get internet access. Um, it is possible for you to run your own CoCalc in uh, on your own web server, but uh, that might not be for everyone. <laughs> um, so then I just had one. Hey, Brandon, there was one question you can get to that was in the uh, in the chat. Somebody was asking, is this a Jupyter Notebook? How does what you're doing differ from Jupyter Notebook? It is Jupyter Notebook. So let's go look at a Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebooks are nice because they're collaborative. Um, so what you get is when you click to create a new Jupyter Notebook, it's going to ask you which kernel you want. So what kind of language do you want to use in Jupyter? So I can go Sage Math, and it's basically the same thing. Solve 2 times x is equal to 10 for x. Okay. 
Um, so this is this is where you get the collaboration um, element if you want it. Um, and so some let's see let's see if I can find where it went. So I did find a course. Some people are already using this to teach pre-calculus, but at the college level. Um, so you do have some people who who are trying to trying to do this sort of thing. So you can get an example of how you can create your own problems. You can have students put answers in. I don't think this isn't quite as interactive as I would want. Um, uh, but this is just an example of how you could distribute a worksheet. Um, students could work on an activity. You could collect the answers and grade it. And it's all kind of you know nice and integrated. That's kind of a nice feature. Um, so let's see. There we go. Right, OK. It is definitely scary. All right, so I just I have a, my own Google form. Let me know if that thing will work. Um, just some basic questions. Well, that's good. Yay, Carol. That's good. So I just put I just put a basic form up. It was just some stuff. Hey, you know, if you were going to teach this class, you know, what kind of stuff would you want? Would you want a learning and coding platform all integrated? Okay. Um, what, what kind of curricular resources would you want? What kind of stuff would you need? Um, and would you enjoy, you know, teaching how to implement mathematics in a programming environment? Okay. <clears throat> so if you could Brandon, fill that out for me, that would be great. In the chat that they, they can't get access to the form. Could you give permissions for it? Yeah, I'll work on that. Thank so that's you. in uh, more it's under, preferences. Okay. Is it, is I think it was gear for me. Yeah. Restrict. Yeah, I got it. All right. You got right. it. That should have done okay. it. All right. Try try to reload y'all. Thanks, Mark, for putting that out. So let's give yep. you a couple of minutes to uh, to answer those questions and give feedback to, uh, to what, what you think would be useful in making uh, pre-calculus work. I will take, um, I'm hoping you still can get access to that. URL. Um, I will post it again right, at the bottom of the chat. Thanks, Mark. There's been a great discussion in the chat about um, changing standards, how difficult it is, and how there's been pushback in the math ed community against discrete approaches. Um, do you see that in, in, in people's response to your work, Brandon? Um, yeah, I don't want to get into the, we talked about this before and we don't want to get into math bashing. Okay. Um, but there's, there's a, there's definitely a heavy focus on, Hey, we, we have the, this whole body of mathematics. And if this is pre-calculus, it's gotta be pre-calculus. Um, and so certainly with a discrete approach, I know there is discrete like approaches to calculus. Um, but the, the, the standards as written, I mean, we're talking about real numbers. And so everything's sort of continuous. Um, and so, you know, I like SAGE because it's a, a computer algebra system that can handle continuous sorts of approaches. I mean, if you want to do calculus, they got derivative and integration sorts of functions. Um, but, you know, SAGE math might be even a little too uh, advanced or intense for just your basic pre-calculus. <clears throat> So yeah, it's, asking the question about um, that we don't have enough time to add something new. Uh, I, I'd love for Brandon to speak to this. I'll tell you that that's explicitly why I'm trying to create these new kinds of programming environments that look like, that feel like pre-calculus. There's this, um, Elizabeth Moji is the Dean of the School of Education here at Michigan and she uses the phrase disciplinary literacy. Um, I want programming to look and feel like pre-calculus. I want a pre-calculus teacher to look at it and say, oh yeah, that's just pre-calculus. It works just like pre-calculus. So that you minimize the amount of cost there is to get started. Brandon, do you want to speak to this, this, this issue about uh, it takes too much to add something new? Um, yeah, so let me, let me just, let me just organize my thoughts real quick. Um, <clears throat> there is a, there is an issue with uh, mathematics education where sort of like teaching in a different way uh, is very challenging because really 
if you want to teach math different, at some point it's got to start in the education of the mathematics teacher, okay, and the way that we train teachers to teach math, um, because we're just, and my peers, not super comfortable even teaching on a computer. Um, and so that was, that was something that I was helping my math department with um, when we went virtual learning is a lot of these math teachers are just used to the, the, the traditional way. Um, and for some of them, they're great teachers and, and, and that works. And so for me, the, the question is kind of guided my, my experiences is, you know, how can we use a computer to enhance mathematics education? And so it's definitely a question of how can we show math, mathematics teachers that you can use computers and, and do it effectively with as low cost or barrier as you can get. And I don't have, I don't have great answers. I don't really have great answers for how to do that. Brandon, do you want to go to your responses and summarize them for you? What are you seeing? Yeah, sure. I'll go take a look. Okay, I got to get my window back up. Bang. Let's see. Not that one. Okay, hold on one second. I have to go back. I'm going to unclick this button. Okay. I'm just going to do, do this. Looking at the time, rather than uh, hold the slot for Craig, since we're having such a great discussion, why don't we go ahead with Tamara's pre presentation, okay? And then we'll just continue the discussion in the chat. Uh, and use the extra time for the interaction because I think it's it's really cool discussion we're having. So we'll let Brandon show his responses and then. Okay, I'm I'm ready for that. Okay, go for it. Sorry. Boom, bang. Okay. So, so what we said would you be more likely to teach a pre-calculus computer class with an integrated learning coding platform? So a little over half, but uh, look, there's no nos. So it's would you want it? A lot of people not sure. Some people saying yeah, I would want something. You know be able to do it doing that um, if there were freely available curricular materials this is this is probably a no-brainer but this is just for our team kind of knowing if we want to get this course off the ground what what kind of legwork are we gonna have to be able to put in and I, I would I would guess I just want verification that was what was going on um, would you enjoy teaching uh, how to implement mathematics in a programming environment and so I know we have several math teachers in the audience computer teachers so this is this is encouraging right um, and this is what Mark's talking about. How do we get concrete applications? Um, and for me, this is one concrete application of mathematics, of programming, is putting them together, okay? Um, all right, which of the following resources would you want before taking the course? Would you want a platform, a textbook, professional development? Okay, bang, okay, so we did get this. Good, 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 good. All right, and then we got some different answers here. Any additional comments? Yep. Accelerate curriculum. So this is one thing uh, that I've thought about. I just want to touch base on this. Um, I think in a course like this, we'd have to pick the power standards. Okay, what's important for pre-calculus? What's important for for computing? Um, and what 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 are those power standards that will be most useful for college? Uh, I think that this is maybe one of the most um, important critiques of this project is getting that balance right. Um, and so that's that's. That's sort of a big a, a thing that I'm heavily focused on. Okay, coding. Okay, from software engineering. Good work. Make it easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good with software engineer. Now let's build useful functions. Okay, types of problems, and I like this. And this is what I think Mark's, um, where we really want Mark to be able to to help out to build to build interesting problem sets that that reduce the the barrier for teachers that reduce the programming barrier so that we can solve more interesting problems with uh, different sorts of applications. We'll have to collaborate cool. with our math teachers. It's a good refresh That's for excellent. those who've done. Okay, cool. Well, thank you guys for your, your responses. Um, and then I'll, when I'll be in the chat uh, to help answer questions. Fabulous. And we can also go back to more demos at the end. Mayara, please take it away. You're on mute. You're muted. Yeah, not hearing you right now. I'm trying to share my screen and it kept not working. Uh oh. That's okay. I only have one slide and it's not essential that you see the slide. I'll just talk. Um, 
So I want to talk about, well, first I want to address a few different things that um, I've heard so far. So one, I want to underscore what Mark mentioned at the very beginning in terms of the importance of, of students completing calculus in order to get STEM degrees. And it's actually much more um, critical than um, Mark said. Um, I, and this is a statistic that I've been using for the last few years. There was a study done, and I can get the reference for you guys afterwards. Um, in tw there's data from the Department of Ed in, from 2013 that says that 63%, so basically what they did is they looked, it was a study focused on persistence in higher ed and STEM. And they just looked at all of the factors, right, of people that actually graduate with STEM degrees. And from, from the way that I read the study, the biggest factor is calculus. And not just calculus, but completing calculus in your first year of college, right? So students that completed calculus in the first year of college, 63% of those students completed the STEM degree, right? So that is the best predictor of being prepared to complete a STEM degree. Only 19% of students who came in having to take college math, like college algebra, completed a STEM degree, right? Because there's such a long on-ramp from that point to be able to get to just the, the math courses that will count towards your STEM degree that many students get discouraged along the way because they're so far for them to go that they change their major to something else. Um, so I just wanted to kind of start with that. Okay, so what I am here to actually talk about is how do we make this work for real, right? So how do we actually make this work um, in your classroom, in your school, in your district? Um, and I have four um, points in, they don't necessarily have to be taken in order, but they can also be taken in order. So the first thing is whether you are a math teacher or a computer science teacher, you need to understand the standards of both content areas, right? So if you're a math teacher, you need to understand. And by understand, I don't mean understand at the level where you can teach them yourself, but you need to know what's in the standards. If you're a computer science teacher saying we should be integrating computer science into pre-calculus, you need to know what's in the pre-calculus course. Right. And the other way around, because if you're going to start that conversation, you need to start from a place of knowledge. And Mark has done a really good job of giving you some really concrete examples of places that there are synergy. But I know and he knows that there are more than um, those places that we've talked about. Um, but that is what you are looking for when you are reading the standards. You are looking for points of overlap. Um, oftentimes what I have seen is. And, you know, I. As Brandon mentioned, like we are being very careful about math bashing um, because I've seen really good math teachers. I've seen really bad math teachers. I've also seen really good computer science teachers and really bad computer science teachers. Um, so both both content areas areas have some deficiencies and some um, areas of growth, right? Of where we can all do better. Um, but one of the things I want to say is that when you are looking for those areas of synergy, make sure that you have ideas of what you could do with those areas of synergy. So, right. So that brings me to my second point is that when you go to have that conversation with if you're the math teacher with the computer science teacher with or if you're the computer science teacher with the math teacher, Make sure that the conversation is mutually beneficial to, right? So nobody, what I had in my slide is nobody likes a leech, right? I was a math teacher, right? Nobody as a math teacher, it's, it's going to shut down the conversation if the computer science teacher comes to me and says, this is what I want you to do in your class, right? It needs to be mutually beneficial, right? So how is this going to, so you have to understand what is the motivation behind why they teach the way that they teach so that you can speak to that motivation. And that's just, that's in anything, right? That's not just in trying to integrate computer science and mathematics. That's if you're trying to shift things in your school or district, you have to understand the motivation of why things are being done the way that they are done so that the data that you're collecting, the proof that you are showing speaks to the motivation of why they are doing um, Doing them, And most often, and this comes to my third point, most often it has to do with wanting to improve test scores, especially if you are a math teacher. There is so much pressure on math teachers to show and prove, show and prove, show and prove, right? There's very little grace given to math teachers to be experimental in their math classes, and there is very little um, incentive to be experimental in your math class. And so, I suggest, that's my third suggestion, is that you start small in your collaboration. So, 
you know, Mark has all of these wonderful activities that you can immediately implement in your classroom that shows the collaboration. And then you can start collecting data on how this is improving, not just academic performance, but student engagement, as well as self-efficacy of students in both mathematics and in computer science, right? And invite people to come into your classroom when you are teaching collaboratively, right? It's really hard for principals and district people to not get excited when kids are excited and engaged in learning because that's they know in their hearts that that leads to the improved test scores that they want to see. And so you have to you have to make them feel it first, right? So that then they will start to um, be on your side. Um, and that's what we do at Seismic. We work really, really closely with teachers in their classrooms so that they have an advocate working side by side with them as they are trying to make these changes. So until they feel like they have the other buy-in from other people in their building and district, we are there as an outside entity that doesn't work for the school that can say, no, keep going, keep going, you're doing great. It, I know it's hard, I know it might not seem like it's going well, but you're doing great, all of this is normal. And so that then brings me to my fourth point, which is share your story, right? And share your story honestly. One of the things that um, I have worked really hard on in terms of the work that I do with school districts is being honest about how hard it was to get to where we got to, right? Oftentimes when you read these glossy reports, it makes it sound like they started on Tuesday and by Friday everything was great and the whole district was changed, right? They don't tell you that we've been working on this for four years and for the first two years we didn't go anywhere and they kept changing the curriculum and they kept changing the standards, but this is how we, this is how we adjusted and this is how we moved and this is how we were able to go around that, right? You have to tell the full whole story of what you did because what your goal should be is to replicate that larger and larger, right? So to kind of recap, right? You start by understanding the standards, right? You have to understand what is happening in the other content area. You also have to understand the motivation of the other content area, right? Why does the CS teacher think that computer science is important, right? Why does the math teacher think that math is important? And then once you've done that, you come up with a mutually beneficial way to get started, a small project that you can do in your classroom together that hits on one thing, right? You invite people to see you implementing that in your classroom. You show the success, you show the buy-in of students, you show the improvement in student achievement. And then you tell, you share that story of how you did it. And when you do that, as a, as a former teacher, I know that teachers listen to other teachers, right? And then when you have a group of teachers, then administration starts to listen. So if you're the only teacher in your school, and trust me, I understand that feeling of, you know, I'm the only one in my school that cares about this. Hopefully this will help you and somebody else will see what's happening in your classroom. And then you might get a second teacher that's like, oh, I also want to try that in my classroom. And then you build and you build and you build. And that's, you don't try to tackle the entire district at once unless you have somebody big behind you that has a lot of power and a lot of money to pay for it. So that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Fabulous. Did you have, have you all in Seismic written up that kind of story you just described? Yes and no. <laughs> yes, well, some of our projects we have. So for the Amp It Up project, yeah. um, which you probably know about, which is a huge multi-million dollar project funded by NSF, they've written up multiple articles about how they did that and kind of the, the process. They've also started to write up about this kind of system thinking approach and barriers to, tra to transformation in school districts. Because there's lots of things that go into a district being ready to transform. Um, and it also, and you know, from from reading the chat, I know that there are people here from all different sizes and locales of school districts, and that also plays a big role in um, how quickly you're able to transform. Um, and I do want to say one more thing as I think about it. One of the things that I have been saying lately: if you are a school district in a rural community, especially in Georgia this is your time to shine. This is your time to have access to all kinds of professional development that you may not normally have access to because it would have been in person. 
everything is going online for professional development for teachers, for programs, for students. I encourage you to take advantage of it while it is still happening because it's not going to probably happen forever. Education is a you know, it's been around for hundreds of years. It's not going to stay like this. As much as everybody's like, we'll never go back. I think we will go back. <laughs> I think it's very hard to shift public education. Um, and so a lot of the things is, I mean, even at Seismic, all of our summer professional development is online this summer. And mm. I would say we never do professional development online, but everything we are doing this summer is online. And what we are seeing and thinking about is, oh, wow, now we are actually reaching the entire state, which is what is part of our mission. So I encourage you to look for all of those PDs. That's really nice. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm taking lots of notes because I love <laughs> the, the story that you're telling about um, that you want to start small with, with, with the collaborations. Uh, share your story honestly, get other teachers to buy in to because teachers listen to other teachers. And it's the the, the, the pressure of all the teachers that can influence administration. Um, exactly. And and it's, it's, you know, it's a loop, right? And then you go back to the beginning, right? And you add somebody else to that loop. And then until you feel like you have enough of a stronghold to be able yeah. to move. And, and you're, what you're going to notice is you're not going to be the one that has to invite the district, right? As you're, as more teachers in your school, it shifts the culture of the school, which then brings in the school district to say, what's happening in this school yeah. so that we yeah. can then replicate that across our district? Yeah, this is great. I mean, I'm, I'm taking lots of notes, but uh, uh, at the same time, I, I'm, we're, we're going to be honest, it's a little disheartening being, yeah. for me as somebody who builds, who wants to build stuff for teachers. I mean, Rich Kick put out, had it, put it well. Um, when I started doing the matrix stuff, I saw it in the standards. I saw it in the pre-calc textbooks. And now when I go out and talk to teachers, they say, oh, no, we don't do matrices anymore. That's, <laughs> that's used to. And it's, it's challenging because this stuff takes time to build. And so it's hard to find the subjects. I mean, so here's a – I'm going to put it out since we know that about 30% of y'all who are watching us now – it's so nice to be in an audience where I can say y'all again. No, but I have to. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, what are the hot topics for you as pre-calculus teachers where you would love to see some computing that might make it more accessible? I'm particularly looking for things which are really abstract. What's really hard for you to teach that students don't really get? But if we could give you a computing. <laughs> again, but you help me so much. Thank you. Identities, I can deal with identities. Linear algebra is good because that's, I need to know the hard things so that I can figure out, okay, here's the computing thing that I can provide you. And it gives me time to, to help to build those up. I'm sharing my screen, just a few links to things like CoCalc that Brandon was just showing you. I've, I've built some, they're not very, they're kludgy, but they'll give you a sense of what the prototypes look like on the web. Feel free to ask those and ask us questions in the, uh, in the chat. So I want to uh, add to what you asked, Mark. I want to add on to the question that you asked, um, yes. because I know this is something also that you're interested in. Is um, and this would be for both the math and the computer science teachers. What is the what do you see as the number one barrier? And please don't say the other teacher <laughs> to integrating CS and mathematics. Mm. Right. So don't if you're a computer science teacher, don't say the math teacher. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And try to think about something that's within your domain of control. Right. What is your biggest barrier barrier yeah. to this shift in the way that you teach? Laura, you say statistical inferences and sampling distributions. Is that so? I've, I've, that's another place where I've talked to pre-calculus teachers and some say, oh, no, we pushed off the probabilities and the distributions. And other teachers do tell me that, yeah, it's a critical part. Oh, it's in the accelerated curriculum. That's good to know. Yeah. Differentiation is yeah. incredibly challenging in math, and it's almost uh, it's, there's almost no expectation out of math teachers that that's even something they can accomplish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a question in the chat during your from Randy McDonald during your talk, Tamara. Uh, where can I learn more about your work? Oh, I just put the seismic link. I don't know why it didn't link, but. Okay, that's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I forgot a slash. That's why. 
these are all amazingly techie people and can help figure this out. Timing, hitting all standards well. Yep. There we go. Yeah. And I think that that's where, and I will kind of, um, and I feel like like family, right? I was a math teacher, so I can talk about math teachers. Um, that is something that we have not done the best job at is figuring out how to cluster our standards together to create more time and space in our scope and sequence. And a lot of times, because I'm going to go ahead and walk that back as soon as it has come out of my mouth, a lot of times <laughs> because we do not get to control our scope and sequence because it is yep. being mandated, right? Um, so that, that kind of goes back to why I say start small. You have to kind of start with what you've been given and show, okay, well, I'm going to work with you and I'm going to take this one unit and I'm going to switch out the project, right? With this project. Mm -hmm. And then once you've shown um, reliability, right? Then they give you the ability to modify more. Mm -hmm. Could both of you, you have, you're, I mean, you're all much more grounded in the math ed than me. One of the stories that, that, that is coming by that Richard was particularly saying was that there's been a real pushback in math ed against discretization instead focusing on continuous stuff. And that maybe part of that is because math teachers are pushing against so much computer science. Can you say, do you see that in the math, in the math classes you see and in the math teachers you talk to? I'll let Brandon go first. Uh, all right, so in, in high school, we don't talk about discrete topics. You you might do some sums, you do a little bit of combinations and permutations, uh, but the discrete math I took in college, I mean, we, we didn't touch that stuff. And a lot of that is required at the computer science level. And so I kind of go back and forth. Um, I don't know if a pre-calculus class is the place for too much discrete topics. Although I do think with a programming integration, you know, if you want to talk about uh, trig functions, uh, a lot of trig functions you can make out of a Taylor series, which is a type of sum. Um, and so it's a great it's a great place to just do a simple for loop and to talk about, you know, in the mathematical standards practice, attend to precision. How, how far do you want your series to go? We're talking about precision and we're doing a discrete version of it. And I think that's a place um, that the discreteness can can come in um, yeah. that has a place within pre-calculus. Uh, but again, it's sort of like we're, you know, there's so many topics. How do we hit the computing side? Um, yeah. And I don't have those answers. And I, you know, I'm hoping and we've we've been getting some good some good responses here. But uh, ultimately, there's going to have to be like a, a, a bigger a bigger deal. We're going to need more more voices. And so I encourage everybody here. I'm going to just throw my email in the chat. If you are interested and you want to you you want to try this stuff out, um, I'm going to be I'm going to be piloting things in my math classroom this year. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be going forward with the co-cal because I like it and I'm used to it a little bit. Um, but if you're interested in, you know, getting a unit or a lesson that has some computing, um, then come come collaborate. Let's let's talk about it and figure out what we can do. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, um, I think it was Rich who was pointing out earlier, kind of like a backlash to Arthur Benjamin, right, and his focus on shifting away from a calculus-based um, progression in high school mathematics. Um, I don't know if, if I don't know of a backlash. Uh, what I see is um, this is the way we've always done it. I don't, I don't know why we do it this way. I also don't know why we would do it another way. So it's kind of this perception of what people, right? If we're saying that calculus, right? Mark and I both started with calculus is the key to a degree in STEM. How do you say that and then argue for a progression that doesn't lead to calculus, right? You can't, it's like talking out both sides of your mouth. <laughs> Yep. So yep. what that means, though, is that we have to have teachers that understand math at a much deeper level yes. that can see the overlaps between them, right? Yep. See the connections between <laughs> oh, them. Dang. And that kind of goes back to, I think, Brandon, you were talking about, like, that starts in pre-service education, right? In our, in our math ed programs and how are we preparing teachers. Now, I do know secondary, at least in Georgia, secondary math teachers are required to have a degree in math, but I have a degree in math, and I don't think... It was, I never learned about 
the connection between them, right? I took my discrete classes and I took my calculus cat classes, but never the two shall meet, right? Yep. So that's yep. the piece that's missing, not just in education, just in math degrees in general, is you're kind of asked to choose one or the other. Um, yep. And so how are we then expecting math teachers to be able to come in and show the relationship between them? I, I told the, the, this, this panel when we were prepping, um, I've had a chance to inter interact with Villa Mesa, who is a math ed researcher here at the University of Michigan. And she's been studying teachers who are using the kinds of notebooks that Brandon was just showing us. Uh, interactive books with sage cells in them, with uh, ties, interactive pieces. Yeah, pretext, exactly. Um, and when I said to her, well, that's so cool. How much programming are the kids learning? And Vilma just laughed at me and says, well, nobody actually uses that stuff. She says that of the 35 teachers that she's studying, she says two or three of them use anything with sage cells. And when they do, they tell the kids exactly what to type in. The kids don't actually learn any programming at all. And when I show, when I show her my stuff with the application, she says, and this gets exactly to the point that Brandon was raising about the pure mathematics. She says, math teachers are taught like Tamara was just telling us about, they learn about math. And then <laughs> bring in an application context, there's always a slight concern. Maybe I don't really understand that application context. Maybe the kids are gonna ask a question I don't really know the answer to. And that's scary for math teachers. And I get that. That's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. And I do wanna say, cause I, I mean, I know our focus is pre-calculus um, and the integration of computer science and pre-calculus. But maybe I'll add one more thing to my list is that this would all be easier if we integrated computer science earlier than when they got to, to pre-calculus. Because then it wouldn't be foreign to everybody. It would just be this expectation that in math classes, there is going to be the integration of computer science. And that's something Brian is working on um, in that, you know, I think, and Brian, hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn. I think that it is a a good shift that you now live within the math department um, yep. at the Department of Education. That's yeah, a good that's sign that's of, of what DOE thinks about the integration of computer science and mathematics. Yeah. An interesting story that I've, I've been noticing uh, just before, you know, just BC, before COVID, um, I was visiting the University of Oslo where they use programming throughout the university STEM classes. Norway has just decided that they are not supporting standalone computer science course classes in their high schools and elementary schools. Instead, they want it integrated. They want it integrated into math, into science, and into art and music. Awesome. Japan made a similar decision, but it's all about integration. Really interesting in Norway that while it's integrated across science and math and, and art and, uh, and music, the onus is on the math teacher to teach the programming. The programming will be used in all the classes, but the math teachers are the ones who are expected to teach the programming. And I think it's a very interesting strategy relates yeah. to the math across everywhere that Tamara was saying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a complex issue. It is. Brian, are there other issues in the that we haven't talked about that have been going by in the chat while we've been chatting amongst ourselves? Hmm. Leo, I completely agree with you about the chasing the AP courses and at the expense of actual learning. <laughs> yeah, um, you guys have been fielding pretty much everything that they're, they're throwing out there pretty well. Um, it's a very effective panel. Uh, when one is talking, <laughs> other others are typing. So this is <laughs> efficiency. We're all about efficiency. Well, I'm really also really pleased that we have so many people who are engaging in the chat who are thinking about these issues with us and raising important things for us to, to think about. Uh, we really do, all of us on the panel, really do want to find ways to make computer science integrate into math classes in ways that serve the teachers as well as the students. We want the students to learn more about math or science. Teachers have a responsibility to meet their learning, to meet their standards. We want to help them do those jobs and also not be afraid by it, right? A lot of it is about improving the usability of these tools and making them feel like they belong in math classes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Any other last comments from our panelists? Oh, Vicky's here. Hi, Vicky. <laughs> 
Uh, I'll just do a plug. I'm doing I'm doing two workshops tomorrow. It's my birthday, so y'all gotta come give me some presents, okay? Doing some command line, command line commandos and get in GitHub. Let's do this. Okay? Well, I have a plug as well, but mine's more of a. You guys have been great. This has been a fantastic panel. Um, I'm deeply honored that you guys were willing to, to jump on and have this conversation. And I know that this uh, there is a lot of um, challenge here. Yeah. So the fact that there are are many people in the front lines attempting to figure this out as we go. Uh, there's some folks in the chat that are planning on implementing some of this stuff in their classrooms or trying this out. Um, we need lots of those. We need a lot of those those examples, those those pilot programs of what have you tried, what have you seen. Um, so. Uh, I think Mark and Tamara and Brandon have done a great job of highlighting some of the challenges and some of the addresses and uh, and some different ways of thinking about this. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. We'll hang out here for a few minutes. Yeah. I think we have like four minutes left. If we want to do anything else in the chat. Any uh, questions from the? I want to the make one. I want to make audience. one comment based on some stuff. Uh, Tomorrow was saying, um, you know, trying to get something to change in the school. Okay. Uh, well, like, I think kind of what we're trying to do here is to get a change in the way that we teach math and we teach applications and integrate things. And like Mark was saying, you know, other countries are doing it differently. And so kind of put those two ideas together. We got to show people that we can teach math differently and it might have to start in a grassroots way. Um, and I think, you know, it looks like we got a lot of people who attended this panel um, who think about this stuff. All right. So uh, to another one of tomorrow's points, um, share stories. OK, I'm, I'm like practically in tears, like other people struggle with this, too. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's really cool to be a part of this and get to see get to see what other people think. So, again, uh, like I don't know if we can just get uh, like an email chain going or something, but I. I need some company. Somebody give me some company. All right. Let's do something cool. Let's do something special. Let's build something. That's really important, especially if you're in a rural county where you're the only one. It's important that you reach out and talk to other people that are teaching what you're teaching. Absolutely. Yeah. It's one of the goals of this this summit is to kind of build the Georgia CSTA so that they build that community. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the math and the CS communities have a lot of overlap. Um, and and we'd love to, I, I have no problem. As a matter of fact, I have a long-term goal of having the Georgia CSTA be populated with teachers from all the content areas. Like there should be a, a gaggle of math teachers in CSTA as well as a, a, a gaggle of social studies and, and language arts teachers, just because it contextualizes everything that we're doing. So yeah. that's great. I love it. What's our next thing, Brian? What comes up next in the schedule? <laughs> oh, look um, you mean that. after this so session or CSTA hosts a CS thread at their math conference. That's a good idea. Are they all going? That'd be great. That's a good idea. We could do that with GCTM with the Georgia math conference, have a CS thread. Uh huh. Uh huh. I'm on the executive committee. Woohoo! So well played. That's why we that's why we book you, Tamara, because you're so well played. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. All right, so oh. we have a, a, a another break coming up. You, I mean, you guys feel free yeah. to hang out. Marcus, or three years. Marcus's comment at the bottom in the in the chat is spot on. That is exactly what I would hope that we can address. I don't want you to be drowning in CS overload. I want us computer scientists to figure out how we talk math. Mm -hmm. Right. So you know, I you, you got to push on on a, on the computer scientists. Make us tools that let us think in math. Don't make us think in computer science to do math. All right. So great point. That's a, a nice ending to the chat. Thank you. But that isn't the top. Y'all can keep going. But that's, a, that's <laughs> <laughs> exclamation point. Continue. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah. So we have a break coming up, and then we have one more session this afternoon. Um, uh, that'll start at, let's see, what time is it? Four, four o'clock. Yeah. So that next session will start at four o'clock. If we 
our final session for the day. And then after that, feel free to do any networking that you want to do. We have networking that happens afterwards. I'll be available for conversations. Um, if you want to reach out to Tamara Parker Brandon, you can use the People's tab over there. Yep. They put all their information in the chat as well. So either way, Terrific. thanks for joining us. Everybody. All right. Bye, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yep. Thanks, Brian. You the man. Thanks, Brian. Yay. See you tomorrow, Brian. Tomorrow, Tamara. I got I'll, yes, eleven thirty. I got you. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying, but I'll be there in the room. Just talk. What I did tell them though that I know that they're gonna want you to address while I have you here is um oh my goodness. It came up when we were when I was meeting with them earlier. I should have written it down and I was like, if he doesn't address it, make sure he addresses it. I think it was something to do with equity. Oh, equity. Yeah, equity and, oh, I know what it was. It was um, aligning standards to courses. Oh. Yeah, that's what they mm. wanna know. They were asking about that. Now these, remember, these are new computer science teachers. Okay, oh yeah, I can talk about that. We, okay. we're, um, so the standards, when we created them, they were in grade bands. Um, and then later on, we aligned them to courses and created the discrete courses, mm -hmm. but grade bands were with the intention of integration and eventually having that conversation about competencies and, and master education. No, that's perfect. To... Because some of these teachers, even though they're gonna now be teaching computer science, they also teach other like math or science as well. So they may not know how to bring all those things together. So that is something, and I think I talked to you about this at once, uh, once upon a time I asked you to create a course for me. That's uh, something that we want to circle back around to is if we're going to do some courses on integration, um, what goes into, into those courses? Is, it, is that a place where we can identify, hey, this math topic can be uh, applied in this computer science uh, application or arena um, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, Vice versa, and even also including social studies, language arts. This is this is how you can apply your language arts and enhance it with, you know, Scratch or this digital storytelling or whatever. I mean, honestly, I would say the best way to get started is to look at the um, frameworks and look at units in math or social studies or whatever, and think about projects. Like, I feel like that's you have to give an easy on ramp for teachers to get started of mm -hmm. here's an actual task that you can teach in this unit when you're teaching whatever the topic is, use this activity. Yeah, and I think let's well, see. And I think something like that would help math teachers to see the applications of the math. Exactly. Which, exactly. Um, if, and you, you know, know unless you work guys, then they're like, oh, now I see. Yep. Like, oh, it works like that. Well, then it also worked like this. Exactly. And it also so that's what we hope to see. Yeah, but you're going to have to so, hold their hands a little bit in the beginning. You mean, you're going to have to hold their hands. I'm hoping you'll help me create this course. That's, that's the goal. Okay, bye. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> no, okay, right. yeah, you know, whatever, whatever. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Right. Certainly. Bye. Peace.